Okay, any questions before we get started? Yeah. 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 Morning. Not a question, but thanks. Good morning. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to move on up and talk about cranial nerve 8. Uh, this will do two things for us. It will give us some sense of balance and it will um, convey auditory information from our cochlea on into the brainstem. Um, both of those tasks are going to involve hair cells. Um, hair cells are the parts of our inner ear that are going to convert some sort of mechanical stimulus into an electrical stimulus and then chemical stimulus to excite the eighth cranial nerve. So the transducer of head position or compressions of air, otherwise known as sound, um, that's going to be the hair cell. The way that they're going to do that is with mechanically gated ion channels. So they'll be pulling open some potassium channels. These will actually be excitatory in one instance, so a little bit of a, a difference here. Potassium is going to both depolarize and then repolarize. It's kind of convenient. It's a little inconvenient uh, because you've, it's kind of been hammered into you that potassium is inhibitory. And that's true as long as you have low potassium outside. That's not always the case, though, as we're going to see. So the first part is going to be about balance. It's going to be about the vestibular uh, system here, which will be this portion of our inner ear. We've got our vestibule and our semicircular canals. And then the second part is going to be about the cochlea here and hearing. So the, the position of our head is going to be detected in the vestibule. And then the movement is going to be detected by the semicircular canals. There's three of these, and that's going to allow us to sense direction in three different planes. So uh, the inner ear is called the labyrinth uh, because of all the kind of twists and turns in these semicircular canals and the cochlea. It has kind of a, a very windy shape to it. So it's called the labyrinth. And the outer part of that is made of bone, so it's called the bony labyrinth. That makes sense. Uh, within that, there's the membranous labyrinth. And here's where the magic is going to happen. So if you're taking a cross section through really any part of this, it's going to basically look like this. Where you have your bone on the outside, you have a membrane here that's going to contain the hair cells that are going to pick up mechanical stimuli and then convert that to stimulation of either the uh, vestibular or the cochlear nerve, both of which make up the cranial nerve. Surrounding the membranous labyrinth, we have perilymph, and then within we have endolymph. Endolymph is um, pretty standard. This is your, your um, well, pretty standard for intracellular fluid. Has high potassium. And this is why we're going to have potassium being depolarizing, as well as repolarizing, because our membranous labyrinth is exposed to two different concentrations of potassium there. So whenever we open up ion channels facing the endolymph, that's high potassium. This is going to reverse at depolarizing potentials. So that's going to excite the hair cells. The potassium channels that are oriented toward the perilymph, though, which has your typical low potassium that you find in extracellular fluid, potassium is going to reverse at hyperpolarizing potentials. So potassium is going to have a nice directional flow here from the endolymph to the perilymph. Both of those are going to be passive. They're going to have two different effects on the membrane potential. One's going to depolarize, potassium influx from the endolymph, and one's going to repolarize this. That's going to be potassium efflux into the perilymph. Uh, regardless of what we're talking about, whether it's our vestibular system or our auditory system, both are going to use hair cells. Um, and hair cells are going to have these little stereo cilia sticking out of the top. Here, here's the hair for them. So there's these stiff uh, protrusions that are all linked together. 
Um, in the vestibular system, there's a special extension called the kinocilium here that just contains a bunch of tubulin. That's this really long one right here. Uh, this is only found in the vestibular system, not so much in the cochlea. Um, it's distinct and it has tubulin, but it's basically the same. It's an extension and it's going to be linked to its neighbor. And you'll notice there's an orderly arrangement from low to high. That's going to be important because as we, as we deflect the stereocilia here, these tip links are going to be pulling on the ion channel of the neighbor. So out there at the end, we have little potassium channels. And depending on the direction of deflection, that's going to either open or close the potassium channel. So we'll have an increase or a decrease in potassium conductance. And remember, if we're in the endolymph, that's going to be depolarizing. That depolarization is going to activate some calcium channels, as we'll see. We'll spit out some neurotransmitter here. The synapse looks a little different from here. That's all right, though. And we're going to stimulate nerves. So the hair cell is the, the one that the cell that converts that movement of the head or vibration of a membrane into the release of neurotransmitter. We're going to have passive uh, potassium fluxes here, though. So out here, it's all mechanically gated. So whenever we deflect those tip links, we're physically pulling open potassium channels. In the endolymph, high potassium. So potassium is going to reverse that depolarizing potentials here. So potassium pulls in to cause depolarization. That depolarization is going to activate voltage-gated calcium channels. So this is basically what happens in a presynaptic terminal. You get calcium influx, you have vesicle fusion, you have neurotransmitter release. The release is a bit different though because it's happening um, tonically at very high levels. The neurotransmitter we're dealing with here is glutamate, so we're going to be exciting the eighth cranial nerve. There's a very high level of release, about 100 vesicles per second, and that's at rest. When they're stimulated, it goes even higher than that. If we deflect the other direction, it'll go a little bit lower, but you can see a very high level of release. Now, in your central synapses, you'll have six, seven vesicles or something like that in a readily releasable pool, certainly less uh, or fewer than 100. So the way that we get around this, the way that we solve this problem of having constant glutamate release so that we constantly know our head position, not just when it moves, even when it's not moving, at rest, there's still release. The way that we get around that is by forming what we call the ribbon synapse. Um, and the ribbon synapse, I think B is a really nice example, but they come in a variety of shapes. Here's 15 different examples of what they might look like. Um, regardless of the shape of your ribbon, it's still going to be an invagination of the hair cell's membrane. So if we go back here to our cartoon, what this should have would be invaginations coming in and vesicles lining those invaginations. That's your ribbon synapse. What that does is increase the surface area of your readily releasable pool. So you can put a whole lot more vesicles in there because we're releasing about 100 per second at rest. Six or seven is clearly not going to cut it. So each of those synapses, at each ribbon synapse, we're going to have about 100 vesicles, and there's going to be 10 to 100 of those ribbons per cell. So we're going to have 1,000 to 10,000 vesicles in our readily releasable pool. This way we're not depleting it every 6% of a second, whenever that comes out to be. So we solve our problem of that high rate of release by just increasing the number of vesicles we have in our readily releasable pool. So pull in some of that membrane, rather than having a flat surface for your readily releasable pool, just go ahead and pull some in and then line that with a bunch of vesicles. You could have fusion anywhere along here, it doesn't matter. That glutamate that heads into the ribbon synapse it fuses down. So you just increase the sites of release and that allows constant glutamate release. So we always know our head position. Okay, the way that we're actually sensing head position is really by sensing gravity. What's the direction of gravity? It's always gonna be down toward uh, the Earth. And so depending on the position of our head, 
that's going to pull on our inner ear differently. Depending on the angle of our head, that will change the angle of gravity pulling on our hair cells. So here, in this vestibule here, we're going to have two sensory organs. There's going to be our utricle and saccule. Uh, both of these contain hair cells. That's how they're able to sense gravity collectively. They're called the maculae. They're going to have two things in them. They have hair cells that, of course, contain those tip plates so that when there's movement of the stereocilia, they get a potassium current. And what causes the movement of that would be the second thing here, the ear sand, otoconia. So these are little calcium uh, carbonate crystals. They are sand uh, located in the inner ear. That's all otoconia means, ear sand. Uh, because they have mass, they're going to be pulled downward by gravity. Now what is down relative to the hair cell? It depends on the angle of your head. As your head angle moves, this sand is going to get pulled in different directions and deflect the stereocilia differently. I think we have a little animation of this here. So there's your central vestibule. Here's where we're sensing static head position. Uh, the movement's going to be in the semicircular canals. So we got two of these things here, and they're going to orient their um, hair cells in different directions. So in the utricle, it's oriented horizontally. So we can sense uh, very subtle changes in head position. So as it changes, the ear sand moves, and that's what's going to deflect our stereocilia and pull open tip links, causing depolarization on one side, hyperpolarization on the other. When they're depolarized, an increase in calcium influx through the voltage-gated calcium channels stimulates glutamate release at the ribbon synapse. And that stimulates the eighth cranial nerve. Glutamate's still excitatory, just like it is everywhere else. So we'll stimulate some ampere receptors on here. We depolarize the eighth cranial nerve. It fires action potentials, and it's going to go into the brain stem somewhere we'll get to in a bit. The saccule, because of the orientation of its macula, is only going to sense more extreme changes in head position, or if we have free fall. So we're going to have acceleration in this direction. That's going to also pull the sand up and stimulate them. Here's why that's the case. So here's our horizontal macula here. Here's the utricle. And, and the saccule is going to have its midline oriented upward. That midline is showing you the orientation of the, the stereocilia. So they're always, in this case, going toward it in the utricle. They're going away in the saccule. Same thing, though. You can tell the orientation of the hair cells because they're in line with the midline. So our tip lengths are in this orientation for the utricle and this orientation for the saccule. So in order for us to deflect these stereocilia, which are running in this plane now, we have to have fairly large changes in the angle of our head to then hold stereocilia down with the Otoconium. On the other hand, they're already oriented vertically here, so they're already being pulled down at rest. So subtle changes are going to change the angle of that pull because of the orientation of our hair cells here. That allows the utricle to sense little tiny changes because we're already pulling on our hair cells here. We need a more extreme change to start to pull on this saccule. We're going to have to get this direction, horizontal or vertical, for gravity to start to impact them. Because pulling your tip links, if they're oriented this direction, pulling them down does nothing because they'll all move together. Only whenever they're deflected either toward or away from that tallest one are we going to pull on tip links. We have to have deflection or away from the tallest. If it's coming out of or into the screen here, we're not actually adjusting the position of these relative to one another. So there's really no sensation there, or minimal, I should say. You get the most extreme sensation whenever you're deflecting toward or away from your tallest stereocilium. It's very easy to do in this case, 
Over here, it's going to require a more extreme angle. So the gravity is actually pulling within the plane of our stereocilia. So this actually kind of shows you the orientation here. So imagine that this is just taken down. In order for gravity to start to pull on these, we got to rotate our head about 90 degrees to get maximal stimulation there. These little subtle changes are going to be picked up here. The, the movements of our head are going to be sensed in these semicircular canals. Uh, same thing, uh, rather than using sand, here we're using a, a sail. Uh, so so think, of, think of a day at the beach. Okay, we've got sand in our vestibule, we've got sails in the semicircular canals, and then there's a, a seashell that is the cochlea. So we'll be spending a day at the beach <coughs> and we'll talk. And it'll be just as fun. So the sail here is the cuccula. So this is some um, connective tissue that's going to run from the, the bottom where we have our hair cells to the top of the ampulla. This is just a little swelling on each of these semicircular canals. So we have three of them. And they're going to sense the uh, different movements of the head. So on each side, we're going to have three of these. So the, the lateral semicircular canals just flex. I know. Here's your lateral. It's actually, if you go 30 degrees back, this will be perfectly horizontal. Now for the anterior and posterior, we still flex, but we turn about 30 degrees. Anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior. So they're not perfectly in line with our X, Y, and Z coordinates, but they're pretty close. They're about 30 degrees off in all directions. But what this creates is where our lateral semicircular canals are going to have fluid deflection when we're turning our head this way. This will help us easily create that uh, vestibular ocular reflex with head shaking. So no will predominantly simulate the lateral ducts. The anterior and posterior, because of their orientations, they're going to be essentially working together all the time. Um, they're going to sense nodding, putting your ear to your shoulder. The posterior canal is a little more stimulated during extension, and the anterior is going to be a little more stimulated when our neck is flexed, just because of where their ampullae are, but they're working together because of their orientation. So both of my anterior and posterior canals are going to sense nod and tilt. Of course, there will be opposite stimulation of them, but together, they'll communicate that movement of the head. The main point here is that we have three semicircular canals oriented pretty much at 90 degrees from one another. Not 90 degrees from the world, but 90 degrees from one another. And that allows us to sense three-dimensional head movement, no matter what we're doing, whether we're saying no or yes. Different canals are going to be stimulated or inhibited differently but together they'll sense that head movement. And the reason that they are sensitive to movement is because of how they are stimulated. It's not sand being pulled down by gravity, it's a sail that's catching the movement of endolymph within the canals. Because my lateral canals are oriented as such, when I turn my head, they turn as well. The fluid within it is a little viscous, doesn't move, so it provides some drag that then pushes on this sail here, pushes on the cuffula. When this gets pushed, it deflects the stereocilia of the hair cells embedded in it. But it's only going to be pushed while my head is moving. If my head's not moving, there's no movement of endolymph relative to the cuffula, no deflection of hair cells, no stimulation of the semicircular canals. Static head position has everything to do with gravity. Head movements has to do with displacing this cuffula. When you turn, you're moving relative to the endolymph. That movement pushes your cuffula against it and deflects the hair cells. Yeah? Would, with that fluid movement, I know it's viscous, but would there be any like backwards? Because it's a fluid, wouldn't it go backwards mm -hmm. against it? We just like understand that in our brain away and yeah. don't have an effect. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a part of sensing the cessation of that motion as well. Yeah. 
Exactly. So depending on the direction of movement, that's how your head is rotating, that's going to determine which one of these ampullae down here is going to be deflected maximally. And depending on the direction of deflection, they'll either be stimulated, if we're pushing our stereo cilia toward the taller one, that'll pull open tip links, and the other side of the head will be inhibited. So when I'm turning my head to the right, that's going to stimulate my right lateral and inhibit my left lateral. And those together are going to communicate the same message. I'm turning right. So we sense movement of the head using semicircular canals. I think we have a little movie here as well. So we're still stimulating the vestibular nerve here. It's still, we're still going to have glutamate release at ribbon synapses. We're still deflecting hair cells. But what we're sensing here is movement of that cupula. The rotation of our head that's going to push on the cupula and stimulate hair cells. They're about 90 degrees from one another. Here's your lateral there, the anterior posterior. They meet up and join here. Again, they're pretty much always going to be working together. Uh, hopefully we'll get some head movement. Great, okay, so down there in those swellings, there's one swelling per canal. Here's where we're actually sensing uh, head movement. We got our sail here. As the head moves, it pushes the sail, deflects stereocilia. When stereocilia are deflected, they either open or close those mechanically gated ion channels out there at the tip. If they open them, potassium flows in, depolarizes the cell, calcium flows in, we spit out glutamate. If we deflect toward the lower stereocilium, we close our tip links, we decrease potassium influx, we have to polarize, we spit out a little less glutamate. So the two sides of our head are going to be in agreement. They'll always be saying pretty much the opposite thing of one another, but that's good. They're in agreement there. I'm turning right because I'm less active, I'm turning right because I'm more active. So they're gonna send a consistent message here. Uh, that message is going to enter our brainstem. So the primary afferents live in the vestibular ganglion. The vestibular afferents are going to project into the brain stem. Now they can go directly to the cerebellum as we've already covered. They can also hit their secondary afferents within the vestibular nuclei. And there's a bunch of these. Depending on which vestibular nucleus we're talking about, that's going to determine whether or not we're more involved with the non-conscious downward projections into the spinal cord or whether we're going to head on up and try to create some sense of balance. Depending on whether you're lateral or medial there, that's going to also determine which part of that vestibular spinal tract you're a part of. So the more lateral regions of that, lower parts of the body, more medial portions of the vestibular nucleus, that's going to create our medial vestibular spinal tract, and that deals a lot more with head position. So that whenever we bend over, we can keep our head level. And then we can play pool. This is going to be more important for standing and walking. So some of those um, secondary afferents are going to have motor function in that case. They're going to go down and control lower motor neurons. Others will project upward. Um, and there's going to be a couple different targets here. They can hit gaze centers that are going to control the activity of our cranial nerves that control the eyes. That's going to create the vestibular ocular reflex. So the ascending track is going to have some non-conscious functions. That's going to be the VOR. Remember when you turn your head, stimulation of the lateral ducts there is going to convey head turning and we get the opposite movement of the eyes so we can fix our gaze. Uh, there's also ascending tracks that are going to create a sense of balance. So in this case, just your vestibular spinal tract, we've got the same primary afferent. Our secondary afferent is going to be the vestibular nuclei and that, that tertiary afferent is going to be down in the spinal cord, those lower motor neurons, so that we can actually control our limbs and neck. Heading on upward, we're going to hit, in this case, our lateral gaze center. So whenever we turn our head to the right, 
We push on that cupula in the lateral duct. The right vestibular nucleus is going to then cross over, stimulate the left gaze center. It's going to do what it does. We'll talk about that when the time comes. The thing that it's going to do is turn both eyes to the left. So we're going to activate our left inducens and our right medial ocular motor nucleus. Left eye turns left, right eye turns left, so that we can offset movements of the head. So this is one of those ascending tracks. Uh, the other ascending tract is going to make its way up eventually to the cortex. So we're going to head on up, of course, to the thalamus. All roads to the cortex lead through the thalamus. So the vestibulothalamic tract is what that sounds like. It goes from the vestibular nuclei on up to the thalamus. Um, this is going to converge with other input from lower extremities. So the somatosensory feedback that we're getting, also visual input, that's going to contribute to our sense of balance. If the floor is suddenly coming toward me, that tells me that I'm probably falling. That's going to contribute to my sense of balance. And all of this is going to converge in the parietal insular vestibular cortex. So in the insular cortex, it's buried beneath our uh, temporal, parietal, frontal lobes. The insular cortex is hidden beneath that. So here you can see they peeled it open. Right there at the junction between our temporal, parietal cortex, buried in there, this is where we create our sense of balance. Uh, this is pretty close to our auditory cortex, as we're going to see. And that's not too surprising. It's still the eighth cranial nerve. So information from the ear is going to hit similar portions of the cortex. And here's where we integrate our somatosensory input, which will be also encoded about here. Our visual input that will make its way on over from our occipital lobe and the arising vestibular input. So we can take into account head position and movement, input from the rest of our body as well. So are we standing on firm ground? Is there any movement of our limbs? Are we sensing any change in joint position that might suggest that our body is moving, even if our head isn't necessarily? And visual input. What's the rest of the world doing? If it's standing still, I'm probably standing still too. All those come together to create our sense of balance. And here's where the magic happens. Any questions? Great. All right. Let's go through these, and then we'll move on to hearing. All right. Well, then let's talk about <coughs> how we hear. Um, pretty much the same story. Slightly different area of the inner ear, but it's still hair cells. Uh, there's two different types here, but they're both pretty much doing the same thing. They're going to transduce vibration in the inner ear to stimulation of the cochlear nerve, so the auditory portion of the uh, eighth cranial nerve. Same thing, move toward the taller stereocilium, the potassium influx, voltage-gated calcium channels stimulate glutamate release. They also open up those calcium-gated potassium channels and we repolarize. Same thing, because it's in a different part of the inner ear, it's going to respond to different types of sensory input. It's going to have slightly different primary afferents, so it's going to hit different parts of the brainstem and thus different parts of the cortex and produce a different perception. Rather than creating balance, we're perceiving pitch, um, volume, timber, whatever that is. <laughs> so, um, when we're talking about sound, these are going to be compressions of air that are going to uh, enter your ear, push on the tympanic membrane. Um, we have an amplifier here that would be our, our middle ear. So we have these, these little tiny bones here. Uh, there's innervation to small muscles that can dampen this sound so we can decrease the volume if it's very loud. Uh, more on that when we talk about facial innervation. But what, that, what the compressions of air lead to, when they vibrate this membrane, they vibrate these bones, you're 
We're going to push on the oval window. That's going to move around the, the perilymph within, in this case, our cochlea. And then we got a little round window to relieve the pressure. So as we're pushing on the oval, this little membrane right here, the round window can come out so that we don't have any increase in pressure. We're not damaging cells. So we're just kind of moving fluid back and forth. And that's going to vibrate the basilar membrane. That's what's going to move our hair cells. That's what's going to then stimulate potassium currents and glutamate release. So we're dealing right here. Now we're in the seashell. That's going to stimulate the auditory nerve, and we'll pick that up at a sound. So if we were to unroll the cochlea, we're pushing on the oval window. The round window is here to relieve that pressure. This kind of goes up and back to create a circuit. And different portions of that basilar membrane are going to be longer or shorter, and thus they're going to vibrate at different characteristic frequencies. So those that are a little closer to the base of the cochlea, these actually have shorter fibers. Even though the cochlea is wider here, what we're talking about is the thickness of the basilar membrane. So those that are a little thinner, these are kind of like uh, strings on an instrument. The thinner strings have higher pitch, so they're going to vibrate at a higher characteristic frequency than a thicker string. And that's what we have out here. So the uh, basilar membrane is going to thicken up as we move toward the apex, and thus it vibrates more strongly with lower frequency sound, just like the big strings on a guitar or piano. So as that fluid is moving around at different frequencies, it vibrates this membrane. Different portions will vibrate more strongly depending on the frequency of that fluid vibration. So when we have high-pitched sounds, we're going to have a lot more vibration here in this portion of the cochlea. That's going to stimulate different portions of the auditory nerve. So we're going to have a different pattern of output depending on which part of the cochlea we have maximal deflection of our basilar membrane. So that pattern gets transferred to a pattern in the auditory nerve, which of course is going to create a different pattern eventually in our cortex and we'll perceive it as a higher or lower pitch. You can see this frequency mapping in the cochlea. So as you move further from the base or closer to the base, you can see the characteristic frequency that's going to maximally stimulate the hair cells in that portion of the cochlea increases as you get closer to the base. That's exactly what we see right here in cartoon format. Here's the data that makes us think that. So different parts of the cochlea respond to different frequencies of sound. And that's because the basilar membrane has different thickness. <clears throat> so when the basilar membrane is vibrating, that's going to push on the organ of cordy. This is where the magic happens. So this is the sensory portion of the cochlea. So when the basilar membrane is vibrating up and down, here's what's going to be different lengths. This is a little shorter, closer to the base, and this distance is going to increase as you move further from the base. That's why it'll vibrate at different frequencies. As this is vibrating up and down, that's going to push our hair cells right here up against this second membrane. So this tectorial membrane is going to sit here. The basilar membrane is vibrating up and down. When we push hair cells into the tectorial membrane, that's going to deflect their stereocilia, open up potassium channels, and depolarize them. So that vibration back and forth is going to create this, this uh, oscillatory excitation. So that the vibration up excites, back down. No more excitation. <laughs> excitation. Loss of excitation. So we'll get a characteristic frequency of excitation. So the frequency of vibration will be related to the frequency of glutamate output. There's, a, there's two different types of hair cells. There's the inner hair cell. This is the one that is probably more important for hearing, actually picking up the sound. And then there's the outer hair cells. These act as amplifiers. And they also seem to act as um, pain-sensing hair cells. So when there's extreme 
uh, vibration. When there's very loud sounds, it can hurt our ears. The reason that it hurts is because the outer hair cells are connected to no susceptive afferents, those smaller A delta and C fibers. This will create pain from very loud sound. Normally, we're not stimulating these heavily, so we don't perceive pain in response to normal sounds. You might not like the words that I say, but they don't physically hurt. <laughs> the inner hair cells are the ones that are going to pick up those more subtle vibrations and create the perception of sound. The way that our outer hair cells act as an amplifier is by changing their length so that when they are depolarized, they actually shorten. And when they hyperpolarize, they lengthen. This has to do with a little protein called Prestin that soaks up chloride and changes its length. Who cares? <laughs> what matters is that when you push your vascular membrane up, these outer hair cells are connected to the pectoral membrane, not the inner. Because they're connected there, when you push up and start to depolarize your outer hair cells, they shrink. Further pulling your vascular membrane up, or most likely pulling your tectorial membrane down, but what it does is increase deflection of the inner hair cell. So they amplify these movements so that whenever they get pushed upward and depolarized, they shorten and pull that basilar membrane up a little further. This just allows quiet, very, very uh, uh, low amplitude sounds to still be picked up. Uh, from there, we're going to project on into the brainstem. No surprise there. We're going to be hitting very similar areas. So right there, near the vestibular nuclei, we have the cochlear uh, nuclei. So these are going to receive auditory input from the cochleus, rather than head position and movement information from the vestibule. Um, the track on up to the auditory cortex is going to be it's mostly contralateral. There is some bilateral um, innervation that takes place, but mostly the left ear is going to stimulate the right cortex, but not exclusively. There's going to be some crossing over along the way. Um, the inferior colliculi are connected with one another. These fibers aren't quite completely contralateral. But we're going to go from our uh, cochlear nuclei to the inferior colliculus, then to the medial geniculate nucleus. So here's the thalamus now. Now we're in the thalamus. There's also a direct projection from the cochlear nucleus on up to the medial geniculate nucleus as well. So we can bypass the inferior colliculus. Just keep that in mind. But we cannot bypass the medial geniculate nucleus. All rows of the cortex go to the thalamus. So if we want to get auditory information from our brainstem, into the cortex, we have to go through the thalamus. Now, since we want to target auditory portions of the cortex, we have to hit the auditory portion of the thalamus. So we're not going to go to the ventral posterior nuclei. This is not somatosensory information. We're not going to go to the ventral lateral nuclei. This is not motor information. We're going to go to the medial geniculate nucleus because that's going to hook us into our primary auditory cortex. Now, all along the way, we, we preserve that tonotopic map. Different neurons in our cochlear nucleus are going to respond to different frequencies of sound because they have different input from the auditory nerve. The auditory nerve has different afferents that are connected to different parts of the cochlea. So that tonotopic map that we make in the cochlea is preserved all throughout, every step along the way. And once we get into our primary auditory cortex right here, we still have a tonotopic map where certain parts of the cortex respond to higher frequency sound and others respond to lower frequency sound. So depending on which part of the auditory cortex is active, that's going to be related to the pitch. This will help us distinguish high pitch from low pitch. Um, how we actually perceive that sound depends really on areas outside the auditory cortex. So this is a complicated task of putting together what, what do words mean. 
someone's honking their horn, maybe the light changed. We have to make sense of these sounds in other areas. So that processing is done outside, and that's beyond the scope of today's lecture. All we're doing is carrying sound from the inner ear on up to the cortex. And really the only job of the eighth cranial nerve is to go from the inner ear to the brainstem. The brainstem is going to do some processing along the way uh, before we get up to the cortex. Uh, one of the important things that it's going to do is help us localize sound. So that we can tell if it's coming from the right or the left. So there's going to be some stops along the way as we're going from the cochlear nuclei on up to the midbrain and then eventually thalamus and then to where the magic happens, I suppose. So the, the, the error detector here is still the olive, but now we're in the superior portion of it rather than inferior. And when I'm, when I'm talking error detection, what I mean is the difference in sound from our right and left ears. That's what's going to determine where is that sound coming from. And there's two things that we take into account. There's the amplitude, so how loud is it? And then there's the timing. And different parts of the superior olive are going to handle those two different functions. So here's our first stop along the way. So we'll hit the superior olive. And all of these nuclei are going to be interconnected back and forth. And all will have some degree of tonotopic mapping as well. So we have two portions of it. There's a lateral portion and then a medial portion. Here they are. They're both going to be uh, involved with localizing sound, and they do it in two distinct ways. So the lateral superior olive up here, this is going to have excitatory input from the ipsilateral cochlear nucleus, so on the same side. The level of activity on the same side is going to be related to the amount of excitatory input over here. The contralateral cochlear nucleus is going to make a pit stop along the way in the medial nucleus of the trapezoid body. That's going to stimulate inhibitory interneurons that provide lysinergic input to the lateral superior olive. So ipsilateral is excitation, contralateral is inhibition. Which one of those wins depends on how loud the sound is. If the sound is louder on the ipsilateral side, we'll have more excitation here than on this other side. So if this lateral superior olive is more active on, in this case, the right side than the left side, that tells us it came from the right ear. Because we had greater excitation than inhibition here and greater inhibition than excitation there. So based on the amplitude of sound, that determines your ratio of glutamate and glycine input. Yeah. I'm assuming because this is all very we can, like in a sense, train this so we can get better at determining. Because like error detection, like mm -hmm. we can better determine the right. Probably. I have no idea. Oh. Yeah, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Presumably you can get better at it. I think you can probably improve any aspect of nervous system function in practice. Yeah. Uh, the medial superior olive is a little bit different. Um, so this is going to be more involved with coincident activation. So we're going to get, we're, we will get excitatory input from both sides. There's going to be different neurons within the medial superior olive that are going to be activated depending on the timing of this excitatory input. So let's consider a simple model of our medial superior olive. Excitatory input from the left. So from that left cochlear nucleus and from the right. When that excitation arrives depends on when each ear perceives the sound. If they perceive it at the exact same time, as that active potential travels along, we excite here, here, up, and we both excite here. So we'll have the strongest output in this neuron compared to these others, and we'll learn to interpret that to mean that both ears were stimulated at the same time. Sounds coming from there, maybe over there. If it's coming from one side, let's say my right, from the right ear in this case, if that is stimulated first, 
That cochlear nucleus is stimulated first, and its action potential is going to start a little bit before the left ear. So here they're going to converge on a different neuron within the medial superior olive. So if we're stimulating the right first, we're going to be heading over this way, depending on the difference in that timing. The closer they are together, the closer toward the middle we're going to be activating. If we stimulate the left ear first, if sound is coming from over here, I stimulate that cochlear nucleus first. It gets a little bit of a head start. Then the sound hits my right, and they're going to arrive here on this one. So different neurons in the medial superior olive are going to get coincident excitatory input from the left and right, depending on the timing. Both of these are going to work together. Based on how loud the sound is, if it's louder in one ear than the other, and based on the timing, different portions of the medial superior olive are going to be activated, depending on whether both ears are stimulated at the same time. <laughs> or whether the right ear is maybe stimulated first so its action potential could travel a bit further in the left ears by the time they collided here in the medial superior olive. Both of those together give us some idea of which ear was active first. That's how we're going to localize sound. The timing and volume. From the superior olive, we're going to head on up inferior folliculus. From the inferior colliculus, we're going to go on up to the medial geniculate nucleus and then eventually the cortex. Uh, in all of these cases, there's going to be some uh, motor output to affect the cochlea, for example. So our, our olive can feed back to the cochlea so that we can tune into certain frequencies of sounds over others. And the inferior colliculi uh, can help turn our head, for example, when there's a, a loud sound. So there will be automatic motor output from here as well that's going to descend. So we'll head down to the spinal cord to create some reflexes. So we'll have some pit stops along the way, but ultimately we're going to hit the midbrain, the inferior colliculi. That's our, our first stop. Then we'll get to the medial geniculate nucleus. And from there, we go up to the cortex. We create some perception of sound. What it means depends on other core polarities. Any questions?